Good afternoon and welcome to our Oncology Lecture Series. I am Dr. Galek Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America, the Caribbean, and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located on the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator for today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing, introducing Dr. Nadia Bombache. Her presentation is titled, titled Overcoming Disparities in Human Leukocyte Antigen, HLA, New Strategies for Patients Lacking in HLA Match Donor for Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation. Dr. Bombache is a board-certified hematological oncologist at Baptist Health Miami Cancer Institute. She specializes in blood and blood cancers like lymphoma, multiple myeloma, myelodysplastic syndrome, and myeloprothelative uh, neoplasm, with a focus of an, uh, on acute leukemia treatment. Dr. Bombache has uh, specific training and expertise in autologous and uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation and immune cellular therapy, with experience performing alternative transplantation, including uh, haploidentical umbilical cord and expanded umbilical cord stem cell transplantation. Dr. Bombacha received her medical degree from the University of Montreal Medical School in Canada. She completed her internal medicine residency at the University of Vermont, followed by a hematology oncology fellowship at the same university, where she also served as a chief fellow. She then completed a bone marrow transplantation fellowship at the University of Montreal and School of Medicine before joining Miami Cancer Institute. Dr. Bombache has attended uh, hematologist, is an attending hematologist at the local hospital in Montreal, Quebec uh, since 2014. In addition, she worked as an assistant professor of medicine and associate hematology pro uh, fellowship program director at the University of Montreal. She has served as a mentor for medical students, uh, medical residents, and hematology fellows, and is committed to working uh, with trainees on the optimization of medical education. Dr. Bombacha has served on numerous advisory committees on boards in Canada. She has held uh, leadership positions in drug and practice regulation at both uh, provincial and national levels. Notably participated in the task force uh, that established the accreditation criteria for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for the Ro Royal College of Physicians in Canada. She is a member of the American Heart Association, the American Society of Hematology, and the American Society of Bone Marrow Transplantation. A prolific author and researcher, Dr. Bombache has participated in over a dozen studies as principal investigator and co-investigator, and has published numerous abstracts and articles in scientific journals. Dr. Bombache is fluent in Italian and French. And uh, with that, I want to welcome you, Dr. Bombache, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. We're looking forward to this great, great time with you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Hakim, for this uh, wonderful introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I will be sharing my presentation, and I am very excited today to talk to you about a, a very um, interesting, and I'm going to say popular topic in the transplant literature right now. And that is, what can we do to offer transplant to a hematologic um, malignancy patient that has a transplant indication, but unfortunately does not have an HLA matched donor? So as you well know, alginate stem cell transplant is a potentially curative modality for many hematologic cancers, but also non-malignant hematologic conditions. Um, and I really like to think of transplant as a modern success story in medicine. However, despite multiple advancements, we still do um, have multiple barriers to overcome. And one of those barriers is um, how to deal with HLA disparities. Um, and how to deal with their consequences. So unfortunately, not having an HLA matched donor um, means that we are confronted with a situation where we will have more graft-versus-host disease and potential mortality related to that. 
Although the um, bone marrow transplant donor list worldwide is increasing, there is still a limited availability of match-related sibling donors and especially match-unrelated donors for many of our patients. And this is especially true for uh, minority ethnic and racial groups. Um, I would like to share with you a little bit my personal transplanter journey because I think it illustrates um, how geography can impact outcomes and can actually impact donor selection. So as Dr. Hakeem mentioned, prior to joining the Miami Cancer Institute, um, I practiced transplant in a large academic center in Montreal, Quebec, and Quebec is a largely French-speaking province in Canada. Uh, most of the patients there are actually of European ancestry with immigration patterns from both France, Italy, Germany. And as a result, my patient population in Montreal um, would usually find their donor options to be quite plentiful. So it was not unusual to be able to find a perfectly matched HLA compatible donor about 70 to 80% of the time. Since moving here to Miami and joining the Miami Cancer Institute, um, unfortunately, that has not necessarily been the case for all of the patients here. So because, as you know, there is a large Hispanic uh, population and a large diaspora from Latin America, unfortunately, the amount of donors that represent those HLA uh, combinations are not as plentiful. And so as a result, alternative transplantation techniques need to be developed. And luckily here at the Miami Cancer Institute, I'd like to think that we are very, um, very agile and very able to practice these newer technologies that I think we should discuss today. So a brief review, um, just to get ourselves going on the human leukocyte or HLA system. So HLA, as you know, is a group of genes in humans that are really very important in the regulation of the immune system. If we go back to our biology, you'll remember that the major histocompatibility complex or MHC proteins are actually the proteins that will bind peptide fragments and present them to T cells for antigen presentation. HLA genes are categorized into three classes, HLA class one, two, and three, and HLA class one and two are the genes that are involved in antigen presentation. So they are the ones we are most concerned with in transplant. So as you can imagine, this set of genes and proteins is absolutely crucial for self versus non-self distinction and for immune tolerance. And so they really are the basis behind uh, finding a donor and HLA matching for both allogeneic and solid organ transplantation. HLA class one and class two molecules are different. They have a distinct structure, structure and function um, and can, found on can be found on different cell populations in the body. So HLA class one, which encompasses HLA A, B, and C is found on all nucleated cells and on platelets. And they will generally present antigen to cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells. So when our patients in hematology receive multiple platelet transfusions and develop HLA antibodies, often those antibodies are against HLA class A, B, and C. HLA class two, on the other hand, uh, encompasses HLA DP, DQ, and DR, um, and is found on antigen-presenting cells and B lymphocytes, and will present antigen to CD4 positive T helper cells. HLA genes are incredibly polymorphic. They are very diverse. There are, as of the present time in 2023, more than 37,000 different HLA alleles. So you can only imagine how many different possible combinations and permutations exist and how difficult it is to find any one donor for any one patient with all these potential permutations that are possible. And this number of alleles is ever growing, uh, not because they are created, but because we are discovering them with our newer technologies and our ability to now HLA type populations that we couldn't type before. And just briefly, because we will be discussing things like haploidentical transplant, um, just to go back a little bit and talk about uh, inheritance patterns of, of HLA. So HLA is found on the short arm of chromosome six and is actually inherited in a uh, Mendelian codominant manner, which means essentially that for any one individual, you would uh, inherit a haplotype from, from parents, so from father and from mother. So as you can see in this example here, any one child will take a haplotype from, from, their, from each of their parents, 
leading to different combinations. And in this example here, every child is actually different. So the children here are not actually compatible with each other because overall one has a 25% chance of being actually compatible with any one sibling. However, you can see that some of the children will share haplotypes, so are potential haploidentical donors. So child one here shares a haplotype with child four and shares a haplotype with child two and therefore has two haploidentical donors. And that is the same for child two, three, and four. And so this basis of HLA haplotype inheritance is important because it allows us to determine who potential haploidentical donors are. And this is a form of transplant you will see that has really taken much uh, place and has gained a lot of interest in the last decades, especially in the last decade. So before you, you see graphically um, sort of the algorithm that is used in trying to find a, a donor for a particular patient. So of course, the step one of, of transplantation is always determining that there is an indication for transplant and HLA typing the patient. And that is usually done with a blood test or a, a, a buccal swab. Um, we first look to siblings, if siblings are available, and HLA type them to see whether they are compatible or not. And the probability of having overall, if we look at, at the transplant literature, uh, a sibling donor is about 13 to 50 percent. And that will depend on a couple of factors we'll discuss a little bit later. If we have a sibling transplant, uh, rather a simply donor, wonderful, we can proceed with transplant. Uh, if we don't, then the next algorithmic step is actually to look at the international registries and to see if any eight out of eight match unrelated donors are available. And there are of course other factors that are taken into consideration like age. Um, the chance of identifying an unrelated donor will vary tremendously, especially based on, on underlying ethnicity. And for example, will be as low as 20% for certain ethnic groups and as high as 80% usually in, in white Caucasian uh, patients. If an unrelated donor is unavailable um, or is simply just not uh, feasible for whatever reason, then we look at alternative donor techniques or alternative donor platforms. And we'll be discussing this in a little bit more detail, but this includes haploidentical related donors. So usually talking about a sibling that is only 50% compatible, a parent, a child, mismatched unrelated donors. So um, a seven out of eight or below kind of match. And lastly, umbilical cord transplantation. And if we pull all of these together, we should be able really to attain 100% probability of being able to find um, a donor or a graft using these alternative techniques. So a brief word about match-related donors or sibling donors. And as I mentioned, in 2023, sibling donors remain the gold standard. However, we are um, unfortunately able to find less of these donors as time goes by. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that family size is getting smaller. The second, uh, and, and perhaps that's because we're a victim of our own success, and that's because we are now able to transplant older patients. And we are transplanting patients well into their 70s, and that means that their siblings are well into their 70s. And older patients, unfortunately, older donors can have comorbidities that would preclude them from being um, able to donate. Um, the last two points I've already discussed. So I will introduce another notion, and that is that Match-related donors are, of course, important. They're a luxury. We love having them. But we're realizing as time goes by that age really does matter in terms of, of donor status because older age, older donors can be associated with more graft-versus-host disease. And so certain studies uh, and registry studies especially have asked the question, hmm, what is actually better, a younger match unrelated donor or an older sibling donor? And I must share with you that it's a little bit perturbing that their definition of old is greater than 50, but that is what is considered old in the transplant literature. And so certain studies have looked at and compared outcomes using uh, younger unrelated donors, less than 35, and older sibling donors greater than 50, and have found that actually using younger donors that are unrelated is associated with less graft-versus-host disease. 
there have been some contradictory studies to that regard. And so we don't yet hold true consensus and don't have guidelines about um, you know, what should be the age cutoff for donor selection. The concerns, as I mentioned, is that older donors, including older sibling donors, can increase the risk of graft-versus-host disease, which is a major complication or toxicity of transplant. And older donors can also harbor some underlying clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, and that has also been associated with graft-versus-host disease and could potentially lead to the development of, of donor-derived um, hematologic malignancies like MDS, for example, down the line. So as of now, we don't yet have um, a clear age cutoff for, for donor status. I will share that at the Miami Cancer Institute, uh, we also don't necessarily have a sibling donor age cutoff. But certainly when sibling donors are greater than 60, we do interrogate the donor registries and see if there would be a younger uh, unrelated donor that might be available for donation. The next question we have to ask ourselves are, well, um, do we know if match unrelated donors are as good an option as match related donors? And the answer to that is yes, we do know. The multiple studies, multiple registry studies have shown that match unrelated donor transplants have similar outcomes, um, have similar overall survival. And so match unrelated donors are practically speaking um, just as good and are widely acceptable alternative for patients who do not have a sibling donor. How do uh, match unrelated donors perform? And is there an impact? Does it make a difference if you're 100% matched with an eight out of eight versus showing some HLA disparity? And we do have this data. This is slightly older data from, from 2007, um, seminal paper by Stephanie Lee, who clearly demonstrated that survival will be impacted by um, by HLA matching degree. So an eight out of eight HLA match here is associated with about a 60% survival. And for every degree of mismatch, we are unfortunately seeing that survival uh, is dampened and pretty significantly here in the six out of eight. Now, these are transplants that were performed um, decades ago and the transplant platforms used then used GVH prophylaxis that is still used today but has improved in many respects. So it is unclear if really we can say that these mismatches confer such a change in, in, in survival, but ultimately we do know that eight out of eight um, matching is better than having a mismatch, at least using the older GVH prophylactic techniques. And you've heard me talk, of course, about a um, HLA compatible match unrelated donor, but do we have a definition for that? What is considered a perfect match? And, and again, that's a definition that will vary based on, uh, based for one thing on, on the country and on the geography. So European centers and Canadian centers will define a perfectly matched donor as a 10 out of 10. So that means that we are matched at HLA A, B, C, D, R, and DQ. Usually HLA-DP is also looked at and we try to select donors that have what's called permissive mismatches, but those are the, the key uh, HLA low side that we would want um, our donor to be matched at. The NMDP, so in the United States, the National Marrow Donor Program will define a, a perfectly matched HLA donor as eight out of eight. So matched at A, B, C, and D, R. So the NMDP considers that DQ mismatches don't impact survival, and, and that has been demonstrated in certain studies. So uh, in the US, we strive for eight out of eight. That's our definition of a HLA-compatible donor. There are some consensus guidelines to help us um, select the best donor possible for our patients. And so, of course, we are striving for eight out of eight, and we use high-level sensitivity HLA typing methods to ensure that this is at the allelic level. We try to strive for younger donors. Um, male donors tend to be preferable to female donors, um, often because of issues of past pregnancy and potential antigen sensitization, which can lead to rejection and actually graft-versus-host disease. Um, we try to be permissive, as I mentioned, at HLA-DP. And overall, we try to minimize any other mismatches in, in the minor HLA loci. 
how, you know, how easy is it to find a match unrelated donor on the bone marrow transplant world registry? Well, the good news is that there are quite a few donors there. There are about 40 million volunteer unrelated donors that are registered right now. The, um, now, of course, this, these are the donors that have registered for which we have some, some pretty basic HLA typing data, but it doesn't really tell us about the availability of such donors. Some of them may have been registered for over 10, 15 years. Their life circumstances may have changed. Their health status may have changed. And furthermore, they often have been typed using HLA typing methods that are not very sensitive. And, and this must be repeated to really confirm that we have a match. If we look at the likelihood of identifying an eight out of eight match unrelated donor, well, the most important variables that will affect this likelihood are, are really ethnicity and race. So 70% probability for Caucasian and as low as less than 20 for African-Americans and other ethnic minorities. And this has actually been looked at um, pretty systematically. And this is a, a publication from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014 where they really estimated the likelihood of finding match unrelated donors based on the available donors in the registry at that time based on ethnicity. And what you can see here, this is the likelihood of finding a match unrelated donor, that really the highest likelihood is for white European ancestry patients. Patients that fare from um, native north, north here in North America actually fare pretty well too, but the patients for which there are very little potential donors are African-American, African here, ancestry, Black South or Central American, and Black Caribbean. You know, the same holds true as well for, for Asian ethnicities. And so there really is a, a big impact of um, ethnicity on the probability of finding um, a match unrelated donor. If we talk about Latin America and donor considerations for a moment, um, well, I think first it's important to recognize that Latin America is really a place where the most dramatic human migrations have taken place over time. Um, and really what comprises the genetic Latin America population is incredibly diverse. Um, there are lots of different migration patterns and HLA basins that make this uh, a, a genetically unique population. And this genetic diversity does complexify finding a donor. There's this interesting study here that looked at HLA profiles in Latin America. And essentially what they did is they studied haplotypes in patients to see how different they were from one to, uh, to another in different countries of the Caribbean and Latin America. Um, and they essentially describe three principal HLA type groups. So um, HLA type group that resembles European ancestry and HLA type group that resembles um, Sub-Saharan Africa type genes. And a third that is more native, um, what they call native, I guess, South American genes. And interestingly, um, in Latin America, what they discovered is there's not only great variation in these HLA genes in between countries, but actually within countries. So within a given area, one could have incredibly diverse HLA just a couple of provinces away. And I, and I think that really speaks to the different migration that has happened. And knowing this, we can understand why it is particularly difficult to find a match unrelated donor for patients from Latin America. We look at the landscape of the different types of transplants that are performed in, uh, in the United States and that have been performed in the last couple of years. You can see that there are some definite trends here and I'll try to demystify this, this colorful picture. So here we're looking at different types of transplant techniques or platforms over time. This here is umbilical cord transplantation. Here we're looking at uh, what's called mismatch unrelated transplants. We're looking at haploidentical transplants, match unrelated transplants, and finally here, sibling donor transplants. And you can see right off the bat that things like umbilical cord transplantation really have fallen a little bit out of favor. If we look at the last decade here, you can see that we are performing less umbilical cord transplantation. Conversely, the type of transplant that really is on the rise is haploidentical transplantation. 
So you can see that since 2013, really, we've more than quadrupled uh, the haploidentical transplant rates in the United States. And, and you'll see that that is not unique to the US. If anything, it is even more pronounced in, in other countries and other regions. Uh, match unrelated donor transplants have stayed about stable and match related donors, sibling transplants are unfortunately, they're going down and we know this for the reasons I mentioned earlier, family size is getting smaller and our donors are getting older. So haploidentical transplantation um, is the most common form of alternative transplant for patients who do not have a donor. Um, we've known about this transplant since the early 2000s. It was actually developed by the Baltimore group. Uh, and already since the time that it's been clinically used, there has been a lot of evolution. So haploidentical transplantation was first developed using very low doses of chemotherapy. So what we call non-myeloblative transplant. And instead of peripheral stem transplant, so a peripheral blood stem cells, it was actually using bone marrow grafts. And the key to this kind of transplant is incorporating a chemotherapy called cyclophosphamide day three and day four after the infusion of stem cells. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit to the biology, the biology behind that and justification for it. But since the introduction of haploidentical transplant, which was initially truthfully associated with some non-negligible rates of rejection and relapse, well, the platform has gotten better. So for example, we now are able to use myeloblative regimens, so greater doses of chemotherapy before transplant, and have started using peripheral blood stem cells instead of actual bone marrow as the graph. And that seems to be associated with less rejection and less relapse. There are some practical advantages of haploidentical transplantation. And one of those I illustrated before. So it's not hard to find a haploidentical donor because everyone theoretically either has a sibling, a child, or a parent that could be haploidentical to them. Um, so finding a donor can be easier. Uh, the cost is much less than purchasing an umbilical cord, for example, or having to pay the fees associated with an unrelated donor. It's possible when you have um, a family haploidentical donor to, um, to go back and to collect lymphocytes or stem cells if we need them, if ever the disease were to relapse. And importantly, and this counts for a loss, there is much less graft-versus-host disease with this type of transplant, which is a definite bonus because graft-versus-host disease can really become a chronic condition that impacts the quality of life of our patients. Now, there are some disadvantages to this form of transplantation, and one is that the cyclophosphamide can cause early cardiac events. Um, haploidentical transplantation can be associated with delayed immune reconstitution, meaning that our patients after transplant are more at risk of developing infections, particularly things like CMV or cytomegalovirus reactivation. And finally, this type of transplantation is associated with CRS or cytokine release syndrome. So after infusion of the graft day two or three, one can have really an inflammatory cascade until the cyclophosphamide is applied. Now, many retrospective studies have asked the question, is haploidentical transplant equal to match unrelated transplant? Are we at the point where we can say that it's just as good? The truth is we're not very far from saying that, but there is still a very recent um, retrospective registry study that demonstrated that an eight out of eight match unrelated donor seems to be a little bit more superior, but there really is not much of a difference. And this is a, a perfectly acceptable um, alternative for patients who do not have an HLA match donor. As I mentioned earlier, haploidentical transplantations in the US certainly have really expanded. So in other areas of the, world, of the world, it's not only an expansion, it's almost like an explosion. It has become the most common type of transplant in many areas of the world. There's been a 300% growth in Europe, in China. Uh, when we look at transplant rates around the world, so in Southeast Asia and Latin America, you know, up to 30% of all transplants are haploidentical, and that may actually be a very conservative estimate. Well, we're talking about 5% in, in North America, although that number is ever growing. I talked to you about the biology behind haploidentical transplantation, which is using um, 
cyclophosphamide um, after transplant on day three and day four. So cyclophosphamide is an alkylating agent, um, and it seems to be particularly useful in haploidentical transplantation for the following reasons. So when you infuse a graft that's HLA uh, different or that's for which you have an HLA disparity, um, in the day following the infusion of that graft, there are some lymphocytes that will activate against the disparate HLA and that will, that will become what we call alloreactive. And the cyclophosphamide seems to specifically target these alloreactive lymphocytes and essentially neutralize them while leaving the non-alloreactive T cells here um, un untouched or unaffected. And this strategy of really selectively inhibiting the T cells that appear to be mounting a response against, um, against your patient, against the recipient, it seems to be the key to performing this type of transplantation. So looking at this, um, th this has been a, really a groundbreaking discovery because it's led to being able to perform these 50% compatible transplants. And it, more so, it seems to be associated with less graft versus host disease. So instead of, um, so with, with conventional transplant, acute graft versus host disease can be expected in about 50% of the time, while in haploidentical, we're talking about half of that. And same holds true with chronic graft versus host disease rates. So a very interesting platform that is certainly um, pretty simple to use. It's an infusion of chemotherapy day three and four after transplant. So that was the first type of alternative um, allogeneic stem cell transplant that can be performed in patients who do not have an HLA match donor. The second is using a donor that is not in our family, so not a haploidentical donor, but that is mismatched. So using a registry donor that is either seven out of eight or less. Now I presented to you before the LEAST study that clearly showed that using conventional GVH prophylaxis platforms, these patients do not do it well as well and they have decreased survival. There are really four new techniques or four new platforms that have been introduced that have, um, allowed us to now perform mismatch transplants with greater ease and less toxicity. And those are the use of ATG or anti-thymocyte globulin, the use of a molecule called Ebatacept, post-transplantation cyclophosphamide, which is now also being routinely used in mismatch transplants, and a technique called ex vivo T cell depletion or CD34 selection. Um, now, these are our common strategies that we use here at the Miami Cancer Institute to allow mismatch transplants to occur for patients who do not have um, match-related or match-unrelated compatible donors. So we have looked at post-transplant cyclophosphamide versus ATG, and there is a clear winner. It seems that using post-transplant cyclophosphamide and mismatch unrelated donors is a better strategy. There appears to be less GVH, there appears to be more survival. And so that is really a, a very interesting platform that I would say is used probably just about everywhere in the United States at this time for mismatch unrelated donors. Abatacept is the new kid on the block. So abatacept um, is also called Orencia. It's a molecule that's used in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and essentially what it does is it, it inhibits co-stimulatory signaling at the level of the T cell. And abatacept has recently been incorporated in a, in a clinical trial here as part of the medications that we use to prevent GVH prophylaxis. Um, this trial here of seven out of eight mismatched patients or mismatched donors um, used abatacept as part of the conditioning regimen, one dose before transplant and three doses after transplant. And all this, although this was not a randomized controlled trial, they did uh, compare results to a contemporary cohort. And as you can see here, we can tell that there is a net advantage. And so the, here we're looking at the cumulative incidence of developing the severe form of acute graft versus host disease. And you can see that um, if we look at old registry, well, contemporary registry data, the rates of graft versus host disease are much higher than incorporating abatacept here into the conditioning regimen. Now, abatacept seems useful 
Um, however, it does not seem to have an impact on chronic graft-versus-host disease, while post-transplant cyclophosphamide does. And so most transplant centers, again, in the setting of mismatched unrelated donors, will prefer to use post-transplant cyclophosphamide for that reason. And lastly, in the mismatched unrelated donor setting, uh, there is also the possibility of manipulating the graft to withdraw, so to deplete the T cells, which are the cells that mediate graft-versus-host disease and rejection. And so this is used using a technology called Clinimax that we do have available here at the Miami Cancer Institute. So after collecting the donor stem cells with the leukapheresis product, this machine can perform either negative selection or positive selection and can essentially remove the T cells from the graft or just select out the, the pure stem cells. And then this modified product can be infused inside the patient. Um, this is, makes a lot of biologic sense. If you remove the cells that mediate graft versus host and rejection, then we should be able to, uh, to infuse these mismatched grafts. And that does seem to be the case. In this platform, there is some ATG that is part of the conditioning backbone. And as a result, um, the good news is that there is minimal graft versus host disease. So these mismatched unrelated donor um, and mismatch unrelated transplants really um, go very well. There are not, uh, there are very few cases of graft versus host disease. However, the trade off is that there are more infections. So if you remove the T cells, which of course are part of the immune response against especially viral infections, then we do see some higher risks of infections. But with the trade off of being able to perform a transplant that we probably otherwise would not be able to offer. And the third type of alternative transplantation that can be offered to patients who do not have um, an HLA compatible donor is cord blood transplantation. So I, I presented you with the, um, the graph before that does show that umbilical cord transplantation rates are declining in the United States. This technique, this platform has been around since 1989. Uh, and does have its place. The advantage of umbilical cord blood cells is, are that the, the stem cells and the HLA antigens um, are, are less maturely expressed, if you will. And due to this lower immunogenicity, we can, uh, we can afford to be less stringent with our HLA matching. So instead of wanting an eight out of eight or matching out, out of eight HLA loci, it's usually only out of six. Umbilical cord transplantation is associated with less chronic graft-versus-host disease, but is associated with about the same rates of acute graft-versus-host disease. But like with anything in the transplant world, there are some advantages and there are some disadvantages. Um, the disadvantages of cord blood cell transplantation or uh, umbilical cord cell transplantation is that there really are not that many stem cells in a, in a small umbilical cord. Uh, and for adult patients of 70, 80 kilos, that's an issue because we definitely need the requisite number of stem cells to make sure that there's engraftment to make sure that the blood cells will recuperate after transplantation. Luckily, um, there are a lot of, of clinical trials and molecules in development looking at cord blood stem cell expansion um, that appears to, to be quite promising. And I think soon this will, will not be an issue. Umbilical cord cell transplantation does take more time to engraft. So it's not uncommon for it to take about two months or 60 days for platelets to engraft. Um, same for neutrophils. So as you can imagine, that means higher infection rates, higher rates of bleeding. And the T cell reconstitution um, is also delayed. So there's more risk of infection with umbilical cord blood transplantation. But um, as a trade-off, certain authors have published that in the setting of acute leukemia, there appears to be a graft versus leukemia effect, meaning that we may be able to exercise better disease control with umbilical cord transplantation than other types of platforms. But this has not been reproduced in, in many cohorts. So in conclusion, um, I hope that I was able to demonstrate today that there are options for patients who do not have an HLA matched donor who require alginate stem cell transplant. And although we do have a limited availability of, of donors on the world registry that are perfectly compatible with any one patient, 
I think that luckily in 2023, we can surmount this obstacle with novel techniques and novel mo molecules such as post-transplant cyclophosphamide, abatacept, graft manipulation. Um, so the alternative transplantation world is, is truly an exciting one. And I'm very pleased that we are able to offer um, these kind of techniques here at the Miami Cancer Institute to offer patients the best possible outcomes. Thank you so much, Dr. Bombache. You have no idea how fortunate we are to not only have you in our team, but also to learn that we have this technology available to the community, not only domestically, but also internationally. You mentioned some incredible uh, components of your, in your presentation, there were some incredible takeaways, uh, especially I wanna make sure that we highlight the fact that, uh, as you stated in your conclusion, that allergenic hematopoietic stem cell is potentially a curative therapy and everybody deserves that opportunity. The fact of the matter is that the past 20 years, uh, you guys have evolved in in, uh, in this field in, in leaps and bounds. Uh, I mean, absolutely. it has been absolutely amazing, the accomplishments. And for us to have it in Miami Cancer Institute makes us not only a unique place, but also uh, a matter of pride for the entire region. So with that, I wanted to ask you, you did mention that uh, still this type of uh, therapy does show that uh, uh, you can get benefits out of it, but still there is some mortality related to it. Uh, what is the percentage that you typically see um, in this group of uh, individuals that uh, are submitted for the stem cell transplantation? That's, a, that's an excellent question. And that percentage will vary based on variables like comorbidity status, but generally the number we, we quote is about 10 to 15% mortality in the first three months after transplant. Um, and that holds true for many of these platforms, if not all of them. Um, the challenges that a patient faces after the diagnosis um, that uh, you typically consider the ones that are appropriate for uh, stem cell are numerous to mention. Obviously, uh, the, it requires a great deal of coordination, a very well orchestrated uh, scientific approach uh, to the treatment aside from the fact that you need a, the support of uh, that inter interdisciplinary team uh, group that uh, will help you determine the outcomes eventually. One of the things that you did mention was the fact that obviously there is challenges with finding donors. However, uh, you did mention as well that uh, the uh, international registry is over uh, or less than 40 million volunteer uh, that are already involved in that particular pool. How do you actually tap into those resources? How do you say, I have a, a, a patient that requires X but doesn't have his direct relatives to help. How do you work that out? Yeah, so we're fortunate enough to have a national program in the United States where this is orchestrated through the NMDP or the National Marrow Donor Program. So essentially we will type our patients, determine their HLA, and then the NMDP will interrogate the different registries and will find potential donor matches after um, estimating a probability of that. So that initial probability estimate is very useful to us uh, because it can take sometimes up to three months to confirm a donor. And so if the NMDP gets back to us and says, you know, for this one patient, there are only there's only one potential donor, very low probability, then we will right away start looking at alternatives like haploidentical transplantation, umbilical cord, talk about mismatches. So it really is with the help of the NMDP. I see. And in the meanwhile, obviously, the patient is already in treatment. You already have uh, determined that they are good candidates for a specific type of transplant. Uh, but uh, obviously, you want to keep that patient in the realm of practice in order for you to secure that this takes place. Correct. And absolutely. That's an excellent point. So before interrogating donors, we usually perform a transplant workup to get an idea of their eligibility. And then we will continue a disease directed therapy to maintain remission so that we can then organize the next step, which would be allogeneic stem cell transplant. Mm -hmm. Typically, these uh, type of transplants uh, require some kind of 
uh, acute hospitalization. They need to be in the hospital for a period of time. That's correct. So usually about a four to five week hospitalization. And mm -hmm. that includes the time to administer the conditioning regimen, to infuse the stem cells, and then to recover both in, in terms of the complete blood counts and also from the recover from the toxicities of our of our chemo conditioning regimens. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, when you started the program at Miami Cancer Institute, obviously it was uh, somewhat new for you and your team and Dr. Kona and the team. Uh, how many have we done so far? I, I lost track. So we um, we are now over our hundredth transplant. I believe we're about uh, hundred fifteen, uh, wow. and that, and that has really happened in a short amount of time. And you know the program started with autologous stem cell transplant, and then right. Dr. Kuna rapidly was able to bring these interesting platforms, and we're lucky now to be able to perform autologous, allogeneic, haploidentical, and CAR T cells as well. So yeah. we are we are very blessed with these resources. That is phenomenal. Uh, now, uh, an international patient, obviously, uh, that seeks, um, in, in a when I guided towards uh, uh, a comment that you made uh, because of the selection criteria and in, in, in the different countries and the appropriateness of actually uh, using the transplant. For instance, in, in the case of Europe, it's ten to ten. In our case, is eight to eight. Uh, so uh, I guess that will be a little bit more palatable for a patient that says, you know what. Here in Europe, I cannot get it. I'm going to see if I can get it in the United States. Uh, what is the very minimum uh, kind of uh, documentation that you require aside from the actual diagnosis and pathology confirmation from their home country? What, what do you what do you look for in order for you to say, you know what, I think you can be a candidate? Yes. So very good question. We, we certainly look at the important factors are one, you know, disease risk stratification and disease status. So is the patient in complete remission? Does he present um, or he or she present a, a disease that's high risk enough to warrant this? So we would definitely want some documentation about the disease, its treatment and the treatment response. Um, we would like some information about just the health status, the comorbidities of the patient, so we can determine whether they are eligible. And then some key features like echocardiogram for heart function, pulmonary function tests can be useful, and some basic labs. So usually with just those tests, um, a recent note from clinic explaining what the disease is, where we're at in treatment, is sufficient for us to already have a very good idea on whether transplant is warranted or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, also jumping into another graph that uh, I recall seeing, one thing that struck me as, as important to mention, it's uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the ethnicity component, uh, especially in the Black population. Uh, why, why is that? Is it because of lack of donors uh, or is it uh, related more to the genetic component? What, what do you think is uh, the biggest uh, challenge there? I think it's it's a bit of both. Um, there's a lot more of a genetic diversity for sure because of different migration patterns, but there are many less donors that uh, come from those ethnicities on the donor registry list. So for example, in countries like Germany and France, it's common practice for them to encourage high school students to sign up to be donors and be oh. on the donor registries. And that's just cultural. And so it's sort of inculcated early on, which means that there are many more donors that have those HLA um, on the registry. While in African countries, we can understand that that may not be a priority necessarily when other things are, are even more difficult to obtain. And so there are less Asian um, volunteer donors on the registry, less African donors, and, and also less uh, Latino donors on the registries. And you did mention that we also use uh, courts uh, for uh, for us to uh, determine if they can be used for the transplantation. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm about to be facetious, but uh, that is uh, something that is uh, at disposal of every facility. What is the challenge in actually getting those courts uh, to be part of uh, the registry as well? Yes, so umbilical cord, uh, there are umbilical cord registries that exist, and uh, those are bank cords where the cells have been extracted, they've been sort of cryopreserved and are available. 
that's even more um, unique to, to countries that are developed and have great infrastructure and systems because it's hospitals that participate and that essentially will donate the cords with the parents' permission for banking to these public banks. So it involves a hospital system that has agreed to participate in, in the, um, there's a special technique involved with collecting the cords and sending them to banking. So that is even, banking and also the ethics behind it. And I the guess. ethics so, behind <laughs> it, sure, and the cost behind it, because and these, the cost of storage. The umbilical cords are cryopreserved for a long time, and there's quality control, so it can be pri quite pricey to purchase a cord. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, obviously, I am not necessarily an expert. I'm just fascinated by the by the subject. Uh, I'm sure, as uh, the rest of our peers that have logged in today. Um, we can keep you for a while, but uh, we're going to be courteous to you. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to meet you, doctor, and for the incredible presentation today. And on behalf of our entire, te entire team at International, uh, uh, you know, you're always welcome to, to join us uh, in conference, uh, either via Zoom or internationally at any of the conferences. So we're going to be tapping into your resources soon. And to all of you for participating today and for attending today's lecture, thank you so very much as always. If you have additional questions about today's presentation, please feel free to email them to bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. That is bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. If it is a very specific scientific question or if you have a question related to one of your patients, and you would like Dr. Gombacha to actually respond to it, please send it to us. We'll make sure she gets it and the response will get to you immediately. We look forward to seeing you all at, uh, at our next uh, oncology lecture series, either via Zoom or in person. And thank you once again and have a phenomenal afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Gombacha. Thank you, Dr. Hakim, and thank you everyone for your attention and participation. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye now.